AI is nothing new. It's a machine learning data science that we all have been using for quite some time, but it has just become human-like. What is the kind of response that you're getting? Because I think Glance AI you've launched in about 140 countries. Some of the feedback is actually quite emotional. A lot of people, they said, you know, I never looked that good. What does it really mean to be an engineer in this AI era? It has dropped the bar of becoming an average engineer to a very low, but it has raised the bar of good to great engineer. Everyone's life is going to change. This is something so big that it's not limited to software and engineer. Your agriculture can be disrupted, your medical can be disrupted if government can uh, form a ministry around it, which is all about AI. Welcome to UpClose, your unique window into the next wave of innovation and opportunity. From early breakthroughs to the latest market shifts, we dive deep into the minds of those pushing boundaries, progressing technology and fueling the economy. This is part of our Road to Tech Spark series. I'm Shivani Muthana and today we get up close with Mohit Saxena, who is the co-founder and CTO of InMobi and Glance. And as we know, InMobi is a pioneer in mobile advertising and technology on the global stage, while Glance, of course, has redefined the lock screen experience for millions. And with Glance AI, Mohit and his team are now pushing the frontiers of personalization, content, commerce and user engagement at scale. So Mohit, great to have you on the show and good to be here at the InMobi headquarters. Thank you, Shivani. Good to be uh, part of this series. So Mohit, my first question to you, you've been, of course, a tech leader and with InMobi for much more than a decade now on the front lines of India's uh, tech startup story. So give me a sense of how the role of technology has evolved in shaping InMobi's journey. So I think when we started, one of our biggest objective was to at least prove to the world that there is a world-class tech company can be built that is not in services business. You know, we can build a product that you can market globally. And uh, in the early days, I remember, you know, you face challenges because the exposures were lacking. You know, smartness and aptitude was never a problem. We had great talent and all those people, they generally used to go abroad. So in initial phase, you look for a hustler, you try to convince them, hey, no, no, we'll do it from here. You know, you need to stay. Then I would say the intermediary phase where the introduction exposure was not a problem. A lot of startups were coming up. Many of us were becoming unicorn at that point of time. So I think the, the model and the efficacy of startup was sort of a proven. But then scale was becoming more and more daunting. You're moving from one country to other country. So you needed a little bit more deep tech, little bit people who have spent 10, 15 years coding and going over there. So we went through that cycle and we made great progress with global product and offering. And then here we are in the third phase where AI is changing the script all over again. AI is nothing new. It's a machine learning data science that we all have been using for quite some time, but it has just become human-like, much closer to that. You know, you can converse to it, you can ideate with it, you can do reasoning with it, you can have a logical conversation. So it changes a lot of things how you plan. And uh, now every company is trying to figure out, you know, how do you evolve and transform into this era. And when you look at AI right now, do you believe it's still in the disruption phase or is it already getting normalized? So first thing is, you know, as it happens, with any kind of technology. Initial development takes quite some time, but then after that iterations are quite fast. So if you see even cell phone or laptop, they used to be this big with absolutely no space in it. Now you can get phone have one terabyte of space and you can carry it in your hand and battery lasts two days and whatnot. Same thing for AI, I would say it is in that phase, but the only difference is right now the iterations are much shorter. I mean, a new model is coming every month and you don't have one company or one foundational model that is going on. You know, six, seven efforts are going on with equal intensity. Even at a geographical level, if you see China, US, a lot of these, it is happening on both sides. So how do you keep up with it, you know, when everything is changing? So I would say it will still very early phase, but you can expect the iteration much faster. In two, three years, I think, you know, where some sort of, I wouldn't say that we'll achieve AGI where complete human-like intelligence, but I think it will be fairly advanced, you know, where it, it will be able to do uh, things better than an average human. The challenge is how do you stay just ahead of the curve, you know, how it's happening, how do you adopt and quickly pivot or move uh, the way things are. So you spoke about speed and being relevant and all of that. I want to just dial back a little bit in terms of, you know, um, what was that one uh, spark or this first small idea uh, when you think about InMobi, uh, you know, that initially seemed small, 
or a germ of a thing that has become much bigger than what you have in now. So I think if you even take uh, one of our biggest AI product at this point of time, Glance, it started with four or five engineers going into a room and basically going and asking one question, you know, there is such a large real estate on a phone, which is your lock screen. Can this have a better usage than just being a blank screen on that? And I think they iterated on it for one year or two years before they figured out, hey, this can be used for some really useful time perishable information, you know, some team I'm following, some score I'm following, some current affairs. So a subtle nudge. And that's how whole thing started. And basically, this is the evolution of that glance. Right now, it's almost on millions, hundreds of millions of devices. And even in the AI, what we believe is that a lot of commerce, even to this day, is broken. The search and discovery is, is absolutely doesn't work for anyone. You try to look for something and it's a constant battle. And that's where I think we realize the lock screen surface. So we are calling it a mobile surface because it's not just the phone anymore. Even on TV, we are on TV. Tomorrow, wherever you will have a LCD screen in your, you know, fridge, refrigerator or home devices, I think this is relevant for that as well. And the key problem that we are addressing is, can we make commerce inspiration based? Can we make it around you, putting you into the center and, and, and can we fix the discovery and, and broken search problem? And so all four or five things are getting addressed and AI is the perfect tool to make it happen. How do you believe AI will really shape the future of uh, consumer technology in the next few years? So there are two, two things to note over here. So one is basically what is the great thing about these foundational models and they are called multi-model for a reason yes. because they have combined everything from conversational search to imaging, video and whatnot, right? So if you take a, any traditional search right now, today let's say you are looking for a white shirt you type Y shirt, within first page, you will start to see yellow, green, whatnot, because it's like uh, the closest relevance, you know, yeah. after two, three, the white is over, now what's the next best, you know, it's rank and it brings it over there. Other thing is basically, there's no anchor to it, you know, somebody else is wearing a white shirt and all, so it's not designed around you. And then the whole experience itself is broken. Now what AI has allowed us to do and what, how we are solving it in glance is, if you are looking for something, first, basically, it gives you inspiration. This is how you various style where you will look like such and such, you know. And then if you like something, then you can, hey, I really like this style. Now I want to see products which are like these. So it will exactly take you to those products. There will not be any yellow shirt. So it will be white and, and that fitting. So it's like it has image, it has text catalog. All indexing is done all together and you are wearing it. So this is all possible because now AI models are there. The way Glance works it, it takes your selfie, your picture, First, it creates your profile because your building things around you is quite important. And then it generates a lot of inspiration for you, multiple styling that you may not even have imagined. And once you basically start to like something or you start to engage something, then your journey starts. So it's like a historical interaction that, that is happening and AI is learning about more about yourself. Right. So, so it's basically agentic commerce, a whole new way to discover yes, and, and shop. And it's all multi-model. You can type it, you can say it, you can just interact with it in any touch, feel, whatever you want to do it and it just take all input and, and, and move from there. What is the kind of response that you're getting? Because I think Glance AI, you've launched in about 140 countries. I think we have some amazing responses and some of the feedback is actually quite emotional. A lot of people, they said, you know, I never looked that good. Or somebody saying, hey, I never thought I could actually be like this, you know, or I can wear something like this. Some For some people, it was quite nostalgic as well. You know, it was five, six years ago, I dressed like that. Now I'm inspired to look good every day. I've stopped dressing up, you know, so we have feedbacks like that. Our engagement is off the roof compared to B2C, considering we have a mobile advertising company as well. So yes. we know uh, our D7 retention is, is highest uh, in the industry. Uh, and now it has started to roll out uh, in developed market, Japan, US, and very soon in Europe as well. And you, you of course mentioned, you know, the evolution ad tech per se is pretty transactional, right? And now with Gen AI uh, in the mix, how do you believe this is becoming more experiential and personalized? In nutshell, what ads try to do is, uh, there are a couple advertisers who have a proposition and they try to reach out to the right user. Most of the time we think of ads in terms of, hey, this is app download or book a Uber or something like that. But commerce changes everything. For commerce, Ad is basically not just showing you something, getting downloaded, it's basically be part of your journey. It's basically having those interaction. So we are closing the loop. So on, on Glance side, what, what you do is basically you have your own, own inspirational journey, how you ins get inspired, how you shop things and all that. 
at the same point of time on the advertising side we have also now built a completely commerce rethought commerce proposition around the inspiration and using ai is where it's not about selling you something or getting something download it's just being part of your journey and constantly matching you with the items and things that are around your inspiration so the loop gets closed you know the glance get the input of what your inspirations are what your journey looks like and then here is the uh, proposition that can become part of that journey or basically there is a bit of exploration, exploitation, serendipity, everything baked into it. So AI on this side and this side together is closing the funnel. If you look at the expanse of Inmobi, uh, you've built a fairly uh, large global footprint now. Uh, what are some of the advantages or say hidden challenges on the other end of actually, you know, building world class tech out of India? Tech stack is a very generic word. and. Uh, what it is is basically is the software and hardware which is that is designed to basically build any kind of code any kind of system around it mm. what makes it distinct or basically you know uh, unique is your business case so every company has a certain proposition objective and then they start to build things around it so i think i i don't think there is any you know you just go out buy a software and you can be this company it doesn't happen that way you make technological channel uh, selection you make your choices and then you start to build what is needed for your business that has been our journey as well and ai is no different so there are multiple foundation models what we realize is basically what we want to achieve mm -hmm. you know so even if you think about inspiration and uh, human modeling you know different foundation models they are trained on different kind of data so some model may work for a caucasian white female but they it may not work for south asian contour or face type you know our bodies are different uh, so what do you do so basically then the solution that we end up building is it's multiple model depending which one is producing the best optimal result. So for Asian it could be very different, for South Asian it could be very different. Even in India for North Indian and South Indian it could be different model. So we use multiple model in conjunction and we take what is the best output that we get. So how do you put that together? How do you modularize that component and that selection at the runtime is what the technical choices and stack and I am talking about and it, it's not ready out there, you have to build it. Inmobi itself has got about, I think, 33 uh, patents, if I am uh, correct. Uh, but when you zoom out a little bit, uh, you know, and you look at India, where do you think we stand in terms of the companies building their own indigenous tech stacks, right? Yeah. Like, where is it that India needs to catch up and where is it that India is leading? When you build a stack like that, sometimes it's really hard to find anything that works for you, even in AI and even in, uh, in Mobi world. So what you end up doing is basically, if this problem is not solved, then I'm going to solve it. Yeah. And then you take a lead on it. And I think at Inmobi, we have always been a very hands-on company, a very big contributor to open source as well. You know, if software doesn't exist, we will build it and we will give it to the world as well. In terms of patent, I think we have 33 already granted, almost 60 to 100 are in line. Okay. It's a long process, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, we are a relatively young company. When it, you look it into the patent, it's a 10-year process. So it's only now when we have started to receive the grant, and the number of grant have increased in the last 3-4 years because we are now completing those 10 years. But I think we are going to very soon, uh, I believe in next 3-4 years, I am looking to have a portfolio of at least 500 plus patents yeah. on these various technology. And that's where really, you know, demonstrating that we are thinking problem from a very different perspective. Mm. None of this exists and if it doesn't exist, we are going to build it. This philosophy also goes into how we train our engineers because there is no company where I can go hire people and who can be productive at Inmobi okay. next day because mm -hmm. we are very different. We work in a very different way. So we have a very strong program where we hire freshers. Mm -hmm. We take them through various training courses and over one year or two year in the company, they are very unique, different engineers, you know, who know uh, hardware, who know their business very well. We are one of the company where engineers know business from top to bottom. You can talk to a sales guy, or you can talk to one of my engineers, he, he can completely explain you how this business works, what, what is the PNL equation that makes worse, okay. you know, what's the infrastructure cost, how I'm going to do this, what is going to be my performance metrics. I have not seen any other company where engineers are that deeply involved into the process. So I think this is what we have built over last 15 years. We are also not stopping at us because I think uh, when it comes to matching the competency and deep tech capability of two sides of the world, US and China, I think we have far greater uh, length to cover. Length to cover. And uh, it's just not about Inmobi, it's not about Bangalore, it's about as a nation as a whole. So we are also taking a lead over there. 
and we have taken the mantle of building that community where we are going to talk about deep tech, we are going to talk about AI, we are going to talk about software, we are going to talk about hardware and how this whole thing comes together. Also talking about the young talent that comes in and they're all coming into this AI era by default. So what does it really mean to be an engineer in this AI era? What AI has done is uh, it has dropped the bar of becoming an average engineer to a very low. Okay. So anyone with a very yeah. limited knowledge can be an average engineer. But it has raised the bar of good to great engineer. So it has created a wide gap. And it's like whenever the gap is that wide, it causes huge inequality. So I think the era of being an average engineer is over. So if you're just writing a code to automate something, you are just doing some back office work and all those things, possibly those jobs are going away. Mm -hmm. But at the same point of time, the expectation of higher order has increased. So I think this is the phenomenal time to be a good to great engineer. People should invest in them. They should really go deep. They should value research. They should value hard work. Engineer has to look beyond, mm. but I believe I think AI is going to force that. Even when we are recruiting, we are now focusing more on the people who have that kind of aptitude, you know, who mm. are not jack of all trade, but they have really gone deeper. We look at their courses, we look at their curriculum, what they have done. In fact, first time we'll also be hiring a couple of PhDs, you know, from colleges, not from job, you know, like earlier we used to hire PhDs only for data science, you know, who have already been a DS researcher. DS1, DS2 and all. We are saying, why don't we go to Indian Institute, Indian Institute of Statistical Science and get a PhD right, right from the college. Mathematics, you know, we have never recruited people with a math aptitude, which is fairly important. Even uh, hardware designing. We are a software company. We never felt the need of hardware. But now when we want to solve AI, I think we want to have those talent as well. So I believe this line will become more diversified. And the, con the jump will become less steep, but it will like a constant movement from one, one block to other block. And if majority of our engineer who start from here end up in the last bucket, then I think we have done a good job. And I think that's what we are imagining that anyone who walks in, spent six, seven years with us is going to be one of the top talent in the country. To wrap up our conversation, uh, you know, we also have our Tech Sparks uh, 2025 coming up where the theme is uh, India at 2030 powered by AI. So as a tech leader and entrepreneur, what is it that you are excited about when it comes to AI and its impact on everyday lives? And also, uh, you know, is India doing enough to ride that AI bus? I think India, our civilization is amazingly resilient and, you know, our ingenuity is top notch, you know. And we tend to work more when our doors are closed. So if you think about is, you know, our space exploration, when nobody was helping us, we actually figured out how to do it better than and cheaper than everyone else, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I think I would say we are the race that works at its best when there is an urgency. So there is no shortage of willingness and determination. We all have that talent. I think there is absolutely no issue. It's just basically some of us really have to take a call, take a lead and start making small differences and you know whether you call it the way you guys do tech spark that is what you know whole thing started i remember in early days how the event came into the play how do we inside the fire you know lit the fire initial fire and once basically people see the value and i think it catches on but this time it requires a little bit more rigor deep tech know-how this is not simple bravado it's it requires a real knowledge which I hope that everyone is thinking and everyone is believing in it. But this is also one of that incident that irreversible, it has happened. So we have no choice, it needs to happen. And if we want to have our self-reliant and leverage on things we do, it is utmost urgent matter. Uh, for me and, and for nation. For the nation, yeah. On that note, thank you so much for your time, Mohit, and sharing your perspective. And of course, deep insights into, you know, the way the engineering community also will evolve in the future with AI in play. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.